Hi, everyone. I'm Amy Riolo, Brand Ambassador at MUIH, the Maryland University of Integrative Health. And today I have the pleasure of having a co-host of Denise Wagoner, who specializes in clinical nutrition and integrative health at MUIH. Her area of concentration is in herbal medicine. She has all kinds of degrees and certification, and she has a ton of experience working with the military. So we'll be able to learn a little bit more from her as we go today. But a little bit of housekeeping, you know, there is a uh, chat function, a Q&A function. So if anybody would like to know anything more about our programs, about specifically how nutrition can impact mental health, um, any particular concerns that you have, we'd love to be able to answer the questions live for you. So please don't hold them back. Um, and we will just take it from here. So again, you know, Denise, welcome. It's such a, always an interesting time to be able to talk to you and to get all of this knowledge um, in different areas of nutrition and, and all of the things that you do. But I think, you know, what is so inspiring, August is, is National Wellness Month, right? And we're, we're all looking for ways to be better in different ways. Mental health has such a stigma around it still, uh, not at MUIH and not within our programs, but I, but in our larger society. And I think, you know, there's a real misconception that mental health is something, you, when something goes wrong, then you talk about mental health or when you're suffering, you talk about mental health. But of course, as we know, mental health is just a part of health. There's physical health, mental health, spiritual health. And um, we need to always keep that wonderful balance between them. So when, when I say that, you know, I wonder from someone with all of your experience and, and education and knowledge and your role at MUIH, how do you define mental health? Oh, this is such a great conversation to kind of wrap up our series, right? Um, the gut brain access that influences mental health. And there's so many, as you said, there's such a stigma that unfortunately is still connected to mental health. But there's a lot of scientific evidence that not only shows this two bi-directional communication between the gut and the brain, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of scientific evidence that's coming out also that talks about how diet can certainly influence mental health. So with this program for the post-baccalaureate certificate in health and uh, education and wellness, we look at different labs and build the students up from a foundational um, place to reestablish or create a relationship that they may not have had with whole foods and how those whole foods can ultimately influence their overall health, not only for themselves, but for the community or the individuals that they work with. And that is what's so exciting about this program. So with the program, you know, it's designed to start at a foundational level, and we, in, we introduce different um, science-based culinary techniques and applications. We allow the students to sit in the seat, so to say, of being able to see how not only can food affect their overall health themselves, because let's face it, everybody is struggling with stress right. and mental health conditions that have been apparent, not only from the past few years of the health issues that we've had in the world, but also in our high impact society mm -hmm. and how ultra processed foods and highly palatable foods of salt and sugar can also affect not only the gut, but influence the brain. So yeah. one of the things that we want to try to do with this program or what we do aim to um, objectively provide in this program mm -hmm. is that not only relationship with food, but how to create taste and flavor within foods, because there's certain foods that have polyphenol content. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, all, all the time we can say, you know, or you see social media that says, eat this food, not that food, or consume this food. But if it doesn't have flavor, and it's not the texture or the temperature that an individual likes, then mm -hmm. they're not going to consume it. So, you know, newer neurotransmitters are created in the brain, but they're also created within the gut. Mm -hmm. So how we um, are, what we're feeding our gut can definitely influence the creation of those neurotransmitters so that it affects overall mental health. Mm 
So if we could just talk a little bit about um, some of the labs that we offer that would really support this gut brain access, that would be great. That's a wonderful idea. Yeah. So um, we start out just building a basic foundation for everyone to get off on the same um, foot. And we're teaching uh, safety in the kitchen, techniques um, and culinary applications to create uh, the, the most flavorful um, and tasteful foods mm -hmm. while preserving nutrient content. So with the gut, a lot of times, if we're eating foods that necessarily we may not, we may have a sensitivity to, or they're processed, you know, the body has the capability to absorb nutrients from whole foods. So if it's not in its natural form or supporting its natural form, then the body can interpret that as inflammation. And when the body has inflammation, it often pro um, prohibits or it um, prevents the absorption of certain nutrients. So some of the techniques that we teach in the labs is being able to preserve and enhance that nutrient availability that the body can utilize. Mm -hmm. So if there's inflammation um, or if there's certain um, cooking techniques that don't support overall nutrition, then the body won't absorb it. So that's one of the things that we try to do. We also um, have a lab that's specifically designed towards um, allergies and sensitivities. So if an, in, if an individual does not have or um, has sensitivity to certain things, we're not only teaching for individual needs, but we're teaching for broad scope because diet is individualized. It's not specific just to the individual that is consuming it, but if you're in a professional capacity that you're educating um, individual clients or communities interspersed within your communities, you need to be able to provide that information for all cultural backgrounds, uh, budgetary constraints, sustainability within the community, so that everyone has the greatest um, opportunity to consume those whole foods. Um, you know, so some of the other things that we do in the labs is, you know, we introduce traditional cooking methods also. So populating the gut microbiome with fermented foods that necessarily, um, you know, make sure that that gut is healthy Mm -hmm. so that it has the right microbiome, um, the bacteria, the beneficial bacteria that aids in the digestion of those foods and aids in the nutrient absorbability of those foods so that we have that great support that influences the whole body to include the brain. So it's really, you know, everything is sitting in the gut and we want to make sure that we're providing the most science-based with traditional applications of fermented foods, bone broths, stuff that you may get in grocery stores, but we empower an individual to create these foods within the home kitchen mm -hmm. so that they have that capability to share that knowledge and that empowerment to their communities and to individuals and to themselves. So that's one of the things that um, there's so many different labs that we offer within the certificate that can support this gut brain access for overall health and well-being. That's wonderful. And you did such a great job of explaining so many different things that I think we take for granted. You know, just hearing you say, talk about stress and mental health. We're so used to hearing the word stress and it's such an important, you know, like, I don't want to say important part of our life, but it kind of is an important part of our life. It's a huge part of our life that um, we don't think of that as being a mental, having anything to do with that mental health. We just think that it's something normal that we, that we deal with. But of course, you know, handling stress, avoiding stress, um, transforming stress are all huge parts of this. And you also talked about eating food in its natural form and the role that that has in inflammation. And it's amazing to hear because so many times we think about superfoods with inflammation and what different antioxidants do and what polyphenols do. And of course that's important, but just this notion about eating foods in their natural form is really, really important. And I think it will resonate with a lot of people. I'm gonna look here to see if, which chats we have going. You know, there's also a, um, a, something that needs to be brought up too about food. So Ooh. we're looking at food 
for its food content. So for instance, you know, when we're talking about polyphenols, you know, and we're talking about food that's enjoyable, we're not telling somebody to eat something that, you know, um, so we do do traditional food. So we talk about liver, right? But it's not talking, you know, that's not really a food that's mainstream in our society. So we start individuals out with something that may be more palatable and really yummy and delicious that mm -hmm. has such a nutrient density. Right. And when we talk about stress, the polyphenol content within um, dark chocolate, which mm -hmm. most people really resonate, can, can deal with dark chocolate, right? But there's studies that have come out that as much as one ounce of dark chocolate can support and has been demonstrated to decrease mm -hmm. salivary cortisol, which is stress. Mm -hmm. So having these little indulgence, so to say, is definitely supportive towards mental health with your doing that. You know, if you take cacao nibs, which mm -hmm. are chocolate, chocolate nibs, you're getting the taste of chocolate, but you're not getting the added sugar. Yeah. And added sugar is inflammatory. So you can still have the benefits of delicious whole foods though you may not um, take along with it something that's not supporting your health. Right. That's a great point. And there are so many foods that are delicious that are full of polyphenols and full of different, you know, antioxidant properties. And I'm a big fan of olive oil and extra virgin olive oil and, you know, getting as many phenols as possible. And I like to, you know, share with people that when you cook, you know, with the extra virgin olive oil, you're not only getting the benefit of the zucchini or the broccoli or whatever you're cooking with and the the benefits of the oil on its own but when you cook them together and prepare them that oil or season it with the with the oil that that oil helps to coax out even more nutrients and um, there are so many ways that mother nature has given us to deal with all of these things and in the traditional cooking methods that that you all use in the labs i'm sure that there are a lot of things that were developed by default, you know, we think about olive oil and garlic and tomatoes as going together and green peppers, but um, they, they go together flavor wise, but they also go together nutritionally. And so talk a little bit more specifically about these labs and how they relate to the to the actual um, certificate. So like if I was going to come and enroll in a program um, and study this and be part of the labs and I, I wanted to specifically um, learn about what was good for mental health, what would the program be like for me? Yeah, that's, that's a great, um, yeah, that's a great segue. I wanted to piggyback on what you said about olive oil. So mm -hmm. we do treat, we do um, instruct on the best cooking methods. And like you say, if there is a fat soluble vitamin um, that A, D, K, and E, that is um, absorbed best with an oil, a mm -hmm. polyphenol oil and how we're preparing it. So with the cooking labs, as I mentioned before, so we, I think that's when we got interrupted. So I'll go back to that. No so problem. when we start out, you know, we're starting in um, basic how to assess the individual, um, their cooking skills, their cooking environment. Like I said, people travel a lot still, you know, travel has come back mainstream now. So people are traveling. How can they still consume whole foods that are healthy and supportive of their stress of flying and, and having opportunities to support that. So we're teaching and instructing on opportunities that can support individuals in those particular environments, uh, budgetary constraints, uh, sustainability, as I mentioned. And then one of the, the great labs that we start out early on is how to develop flavor and taste how we can reduce salt and sugar and use it in its natural forms, um, utilizing the polyphenol and constituents within herbs and spices, how to, to use fresh herbs, dry herbs, dried spices to enhance the flavor and the benefits nutritionally of meals. I mean, those are such wonderful and powerful techniques to learn to over, have overall health. And then we go into, um, like I said, the traditional type of cooking methods that have been used around the world for centuries, um, fermented foods and using nose to tail and using um, vegetable broths, bone broths to support overall and make flavorful soups, easily digested foods that an individual, we're looking at all stages of life too. 
we're looking at individuals that may have um elderly that may have a, a, a decreased capacity for absorption, but need those absorbs, you know, those nutrients to support um, um, mental health, you know, <laughs> incorporating omega-3 fatty acids into the diet that uh, really helps so much with, you know, reducing inflammation. <laughs> um, we talk a lot about the allergies and how people, you know, I, I found through my cooking and culinary experience that there are a lot of individuals that have food sensitivities, right. not, you know, st straight out food allergies also, but a lot of people are restricting, 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 because when they're eating, they're having all of these digestive complaints um, that is creating a fear within mm -hmm. them from consuming foods. So we're trying to instruct and enable to add, perhaps creating foods or adding carminative type of digestive aids to support digestion until, you know, there may be such disruption in the gut, in the gut um, dysbiosis mm -hmm. that an individual requires a longer healing period to shore up that integrity of the gut so that it works optimally. The mucosal lining um, is allowing the absorption of nutrients and it just allows um, that capability of teaching techniques that can support those functions. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, one of the um, other things by, by the time you get to the end of the program, you have such a great skill set that you'll be able to go into a supermarket or a farmer's market or a food pantry and be able to collect items and know how to prepare them mm -hmm. and know how to combine them to create a meal mm -hmm. that supports a specific health condition, uh, mental health or diabetes or cardiovascular stress and fatigue. What mm -hmm. foods can we use that we can combine together to create a flavorful meal that will support those conditions? So we do culinary education and really shore that up so that that confidence and empowerment is built in the individual so that not only in themselves, but mm -hmm. then they can spread it throughout the community and really build traction that I think we need in the society mm -hmm. to change that menu and change that approach. Definitely. Towards food. I really think that's the key word that you talked about is empowerment, because being able to to cook for yourself regardless of, of any type of condition is empowerment. But then once you started adding in obstacles of sensitivities, of health concerns, of um, food scarcity or availability, and you, we're addressing all of those at one time, it's really, really great to be able to do that and you know to have that just in your hand. I know I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about different different segments of the population, maybe different different places in the world that need this in addition to, to all of us which need it, but maybe some, some specific ones that need it a little bit more urgently. Um, I know I've done some work with the, um, the brain injury support services in Northern Virginia and with like the US Endocrine Society and American Diabetes Association, you know, um, different, different people that were dealing with specific challenges. Some of them were stroke victims. Some of them had diabetes, some of them, um, you know, were, were just dealing with a lot of depression because they had different symptoms. And so I, in each of my books, I try to always include, just as a matter of course, sometimes without even mentioning it, things that are great for mental health. And of course, you know, different diet, different heritage diets, like the Mediterranean diet. I know that there are many, and MUH doesn't, doesn't talk about one specific one, but of course, there are many heritage diets that take this into consideration where there are a lot of omega-3s and, you know, fish and seafood that are built into the diet, um, leafy greens that have a lot of magnesium and things that are, you know, different types of uh, phytonutrients that are helpful. Um, also, you mentioned A, D, K, and E, um, anti-inflammatory foods like, like um, you know, lemons and, and turmeric and ginger and cinnamon. I love the idea that you have a whole lab based around herbs and spices because they're the most, in our culture, I think they're the most unsung heroes. Absolutely. 
you know, infrequently used. People have these beautiful cabinets dedicated to spices <laughs> that they're pulling out on Thanksgiving <laughs> and using for pumpkin pie. And it's like, wait a minute, you can use a lot of these every day and, you know, get flavor and get nutrition and, and make your food look beautiful. And, and that's very empowering. Just and you can look. travel around the world with spices. I mean, creating that, that, that flavor profile. One of the great things about our program is we bring individuals from all diversity and backgrounds together and we are such a multi-weaved cultural society now and each one brings in their cultural flair into the program that is just so uh, it's just mind-blowing to learn about how food is used culturally and traditionally in different um in different individuals it's such a refreshing approach culturally from where we were about 30 years ago in the United States, where to be quote unquote healthy, the food had to be, you know, iceberg lettuce and grilled chicken with no, with no seasoning. And to think that we went from that to now really being able to look at different cultures and the different healthful things that they bring to the table and incorporate them and also be able to find them in supermarkets and farmers markets and, and co-ops, because we really can now, which is a huge, a huge advantage as well. And I wondered, I wondered a little bit more if you could share with us some of the work that you've done with the military and how, you know, mental health in that community plays in and, and where nutrition fits there. Well, well thank you for that. Um, so I do work primarily with uh, military veterans. I'm a career military veteran myself. Mm -hmm. So I'm very passionate about supporting um, individuals in that vein. Mm -hmm. So as you can imagine, you know, military life is very stressful, very stress induced environments. And there are a lot of individuals that, you know, when we're, we're deployed or we're in an environment, you know, the food is provided. And a lot of times it's very good food. So that food is provided. So it takes that off the table. So you can get a soldier can get more to the fight, so mm -hmm. to say but they're caring and feeding for that soldier. So when they're discharged, there seems to be a, um, a gap there of individuals that don't have those culinary skills. So a lot of times I work with individuals to build those culinary skills and skills that can support the mental health because they're coming from such a stimulating environment, they're overstimulated. And it can go in one or two directions. It can go into a depression or an anxiety type of state of, um, for the individual. So really, I think building that confidence really mm -hmm. helps with uh, their capability to integrate and use tools of whole health to support not only their stress, or mm -hmm. their sleep. So sleep is really a big thing. So making sure that, you know, magnesium is such a great um, avenue for sleep mm -hmm. and having those tools available for the military community to help them have a mission per se after their mission is complete. Mm -hmm. And this is a great segue, I think, for that type of community. Any, it can be transposed to any type of community to give someone drive and direction into taking control of their own health, their mm -hmm. own mental well-being. There's also many uh, coordination of care services that individuals can work with, mm -hmm. but this is just one avenue and one tool to get individuals supported and feel supported in mm -hmm. a community where they can take care of um, their mental health needs. That's wonderful. If I would like to remind anybody watching, if you have any more questions um, for Denise, this is a great time because she's such a wealth of knowledge. Um, I was wondering, Denise, in the labs and in the different different um, philosophies that you teach within the program, are you teaching things like these particular ingredients are great for PTSD or anxiety or depression, or is it more of these are ingredients which are going to reduce inflammation which or promote brain health? so that um, they'll help across the board. Um, how, how is that kind of taught? So we do uh, primarily science-based, traditional um, science-based um, approaches towards food. So that's because that's we're educational edu you know, institution. So we're using science-based to have that approach. But there's also a wealth of information within the instructors and background experience. Um, I have an Ayurvedic background. So mm -hmm. I use um, Ayurvedic approaches also in my practice. 
that enables um, eating in season. Mm -hmm. So instead of having something that's always available or using um, a certain energetic of a food mm -hmm. that could support, you know, if somebody is always hot, 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 anger, um, you know, just exciteful, temperamental, <laughs> I mean, just somebody that has that edgy rage to them, you know, I would really want to bring some food in that is really nurturing and grounding. And so we use those approaches. So not only scientific, but we do weave in some because we're integrative health modality. So we're looking at all different avenue or all different aspects of an individual. We're looking at their sleep, their stress, their lifestyle, their movement, their activity. So we're, we're using that integrative approach individually with each, with um, what we're offering. We do use, um, so the, your, your question was about, do we recommend specific nutrients to help with PTSD or with um, mental health issues? I think as the program progresses, you can see how the nutrients is, are weaved into the whole food so that clinically or educationally, we allow, we, we empower, as I said, them to make those connections mm -hmm. so that they know by the end of the program, kind of like the food market basket, like mm -hmm. I can take this food and that food, and that's going to support maybe a medication that they're on that is depleting a certain nutrient. So we can use those tools also because a lot of individuals are on a lot of medications and some of those medications can deplete or interact with certain foods. So we also teach that avenue too, okay. contraindications. I so. like because it doesn't just, you know, assume that we're in a perfect world and this is what to do, but it actually also gives all these alternatives that people really deal with. Would you like to take the question? Or sure, I, I, just saw, I just saw that. So um, Allison asked, I mentioned about uh, difficulty for those who travel to keep their um, healthy diet. So one, you know, the airport system has changed before when you used to travel, like you were saying 20, 30 years ago, you might get, you know, the, the cracker snacks thrown to you, you know, even today. I, one of the things that I recommend is, you know that you're going to travel prepare a meal that you can take with you on your flight to your destination, explore the destination where you're at to see what type of food availability is at your destination. We teach menu reading, how to order off a menu when eating out, because granted, we're not going to be in the kitchen slaving over a stove all the time. We're still going to enjoy community and camaraderie ship with, with individuals, families, and friends, or even by ourselves if we're eating out. So we allow that, um, individual to, you know, prepare, you know, take a meal on a plane with you so that you have that, you empowered yourself, you gave yourself that capability and took your health into your own hands by preparing that meal to travel with. That's one, just one, one little um, tip that you could do traveling. Um, we talked Wait. about RV too. Those are great ones. So Solanga asks uh, what the name of my book is. So I actually have 15 books. Um, I've, I've met, they're all on Amazon. And uh, so my most recent ones are um, Diabetes for Dummies. I also have, let's see, I can show some of them. So this is Diabetes for Dummies. I have uh, Mediterranean Lifestyle for Dummies, which I highly recommend because it has a lot of great uh, lifestyle traditions that support what we're talking about. And the technical editor for these books is a, a very well-known uh, revolutionary in, in gut health field um, at MUIH, and that is uh, Dr. Liz Lipsky. So um, Liz wrote this book. It's called Digestive Wellness, Strengthen the Immune System and Prevent Disease Through Healthy Digestion. And it's like a Bible there is just so much information to read in this that I have to just take it chapter by chapter when I'm when I have really have a lot of brain space because it's wonderful and and she's wonderful and um, it is through her that I learned about this program at the university and how revolutionary it was and you know then I got to meet Eleonora and Denise and so um, you know these are some books that we recommend but if you really want to get dive deep into the to the gut health I really recommend this one absolutely yeah. Dr. Litsky is just a gem. Yeah, 
wealth of knowledge, so influential in digestive health. And like I said, digestive health influenced mental health. Yes. And while we're on the topic, and you know, Denise, I know you've seen a lot of people come and go from the university and um, you know, take this education and do it, use it incorporated in things that they're already doing or else change careers. What are some of like the success stories that you can talk about from people in the department? Oh, I can see oh, there's a lot. So um, we have a couple graduates that just um, finished out of the this certificate program this trimester that just ended last week. So we had a medical doctor in there that really wanted to offer her clients, her patients, uh, something other than what the traditional conventional medical approach was. She realizes, recognizes that uh, food is definitely an answer and a contributor towards overall health. Mm-hmm. We've had individuals, um, there's a young lady that just finished the program. She has her own little shop, a uh, little restaurant. Uh, shop that she has, real small, but she wanted to offer these these um, offerings that we do in the lab to her community. So she opened up a little restaurant. That was wonderful. Um, another young lady, she's a social worker, and she also wanted to provide um, opportunities for her community and individuals that had budgetary restraints mm-hmm. that they could still have the opportunities as everyone does to have good, wholesome, healthy meals. It's a big part of it. And it's going to be the future because um, that's, that's so ingrained in our culture that um, it costs a lot to eat well. And, and so people just immediately write it off. Um, It's unfortunate. Yeah. Unfortunately, it costs a lot to eat poorly too. And so, um, you know, the more that we can make good health affordable for people, good, good food affordable for people is better. Um, but also the more that we can plan and share recipes that are in a, a different budget. So like for my last couple of books, I've actually, as I plan the recipes, I say, you know, you can go to a fast food restaurant and, and you really can't anymore, but they advertise that you can get a meal for $6 and 99 cents. So that's my goal for my, for my recipes and my books going forward is that for $6 and 99 cents, you can get, um, you know, a complete, but really a complete nutritious meal. And also something that's going to help you to heal for that price instead of something that's going to harm you. And um, it's, I think for a long time, we didn't want to bring up cost with, with, with food because it kind of made it seem less elegant or it made it seem less appealing or something like this. But I, I just think that wherever you are in the game, even if it's, you know, a fine dining restaurant, it's still nice to look at that lens sometimes because people need it and and you know you can take the most humble ingredient like a carrot and really turn into something gourmet by you know simmering it in coconut milk and cardamom or you know x y and z and that coconut milk and that cardamom and that and that carrot are really going to do a lot for our health and for our psyche um as opposed to another ingredient that you know um we don't, it's not natural occurring in our body. Uh, we don't know how to digest it and all of these things. And I, I just, I, I, maybe I'm preaching to the choir in this conversation, but with my culinary professional friends and groups, I like to always get that out there too. And, um, and it's for anybody who's majoring in this or studying this or, you know, already practicing this, it's a, it's a great conversation to keep having. And, you know, if you show up to a meeting and someone says, well, it's expensive to eat that way, or it's expensive to serve this, there are other ways around it. There are Absolutely. Other ways around it if, if you're willing and, and we really want to serve the community. Um, I think there are more questions in the chat. Here. And there is, it is an empowerment factor, you know, ordering out at a restaurant, you know, having that voice. Mm -hmm. to tell the chef how to prepare your meal Mm -hmm. don't put finishing salt on my on my meal right you know or don't use this type of oil to cook with i mean those are little small steps that gain traction over time so Mm -hmm. it's not it's you know we're, we're instructing to cook in the home kitchen and transfer that out to the community but we're also you know not naive in that people want to enjoy their lives and eat out also but it travel and we're giving them tools that they can accomplish that with that's wonderful thank you so much for all of your knowledge for sharing this with us today there's a question about um, where you teach so um, if anybody would like any more information definitely check out the website www 
www.muih.edu. And um, Denise, do you have any specific places you'd like to, to direct them to or anything to look at once they're on the site? Uh, for, the, for this program, absolutely. So the people that are attending today, hopefully they'll be interested enough to enroll in the PBC um, Culinary Health and Education Program. I think it's, you know, it builds a community within the university because we, all, we are small. Mm -hmm. So it allows that individualized attention towards um, to, towards students and um, yeah, muih.edu. The admissions um, team is fantastic. Um, they're so dedicated in steering and navigating any um, questions or um, information that may be needed. So definitely, um, I think you can find all the information there. So just for those who are watching and who might not know what a PBC is, it's a post-baccalaureate certificate that people are getting. And, and Denise mentioned, you know, some doctors are getting it, medical um, doctors. And the reason is because in our, in our modern education system for doctors in this country, they are not getting a nutritional education. So a lot of doctors who are practicing want to be able to answer their, their patients' questions about nutrition or give really sound advice um, are coming and getting this type of degree. Also, you know, business owners, chefs, and culinary professionals who maybe were only dealing with one type of food, but now might want to start working with hospitals or with um, senior care facilities or with schools um, or any community that is really looking at improving their health. This is a great certificate to have. Um, I know people a lot of times want to get into what I do. You know, you're a chef, but yet you're also working with like the American Diabetes Association or this organization or that. How does it come to be? Having a certificate like this, I think really, perfectly positions people, um, you know, and empowers them to be able to, to say, I have all the culinary chops and, and experience, and I also now know now what people should be eating. So if they're going to work for an organization, an institution, an association, it makes them that much more um, appealing to that, that future employer. A wide net can be cast, definitely, <laughs> definitely. Um, there's so many opportunities and such a need overall for this type of information to be introduced into the into the world Wonderful. thank you it was so lovely spending some time with you today and thank you for all you do thank you so much Denise have a great day thanks you too bye-bye